Hey guys, in this video I wanted to talk about how to visualize the results of VBM using XJView. So XJView is a free program that if you go to its official website you can download for free and you use it in MATLAB. It's usually used in conjunction with SPM and actually on its website it says it's usually used for fMRI analysis. I've seen it used for VBM a lot as well. So if you download it for free and set it correctly in MATLAB then you can just type in XJView in the command window and click enter and it should pop up. So I'm going to do an example of VBM. Let me show you guys. I picked like a really obvious example. So this is a patient who has right hemisphere schizencephaly and you can see it really clearly here. This is a pretty big abnormality that goes out into the cortex. So this will show up really nicely on VBM and that's kind of just why I picked this example. So now let me show you the VBM BM window. Now once this shows up it tells you to go to file open images and it says to pick .img files. When you do VBM using SPM or CAT12 which is what I use then it will actually produce nifty files but that's fine because XJView can read in nifty files as well so it doesn't have to be a .img file. So this is the first nifty that I will open up. It's a T map produced by CAT12 and it's a nifty file. You click the file and then you click done and then XJView will show this window. So this is kind of the window that I'm going to be working with in this video and going over how to use. So let me first go over what it's showing you. So there are three panes here and three panes here and this is the T map that is showing up. As you can see the schizencephaly is showing up really clearly. The first thing I wanted to talk about is how to click around in these three panes. For the three panes here, if you just click, wherever you click, depending on the pane, it will move the crosshairs. I don't know if you can see it well in this video, but there's three crosshairs in blue, and there's a little button here that you can toggle on and off the crosshairs, so I usually like to leave them on. If you're going to use the three panes here, then if you can see there's a red arrowhead on the three panes, and instead of just clicking, you have to grab the arrowhead and drag it. So you have to click and hold and then move it wherever you want to move it to move the images here. So it has axial, sagittal, and coronal. So usually what I do is I will click along the axial and look at the coronal results here as exploratory analysis when I load the files. The stuff that's showing up here are the T values and the values across the whole map are shown in this color bar here. I already checked these files before I started the video. It goes about from 5 to about negative 70 it says here and this is what's auto generated from the VBM results again. So if you wanted to look at a specific range you can change the range here. So if I wanted to look at from 5 to negative 5 for example you type in those results here and it looks a little bit weird obviously because you just cut out a lot of the lower values but for some analyses that might be useful to you. And then if you want to undo whatever range you picked, you can just type in auto and auto again, and that will set it back to the way it was. All right, so that updates. Now, I think, I didn't check this, but these files here are the options for the underlay, I guess you could call it. So this is showing you an average T1 provided by SPM, and it's the gray brain, essentially, that's under the T map, that's the overlay. So I usually, for VBM, just leave it as the default. You have have a couple options provided by SPM and this I think is the SPM forward slash canonical folder if I'm not mistaken and an XJView has some files as well if you want to pick a specific file to look at you also have the option to click other and then you can pick whatever file you want to be the base image that's in your computer so when you're looking at this for VBM you can see that most of these values are negative um, you have have some positive values so if you want to discern positive from negative you go down here and it says display intensity you have the option to view positive and negative clusters you can view just positive clusters 
so that will change the map in real time here and here and now you can see like I said the positive values go from about 0 to a little bit less than 5. If you click only negative it will update again and show you the schizencephaly which we would expect to be negative compared to controls. So I'm just going to undo that and click all again. So when you're looking around um, because this is kind of an average brain you might wonder what specific anatomy am I looking at when I click this cluster for example. Where I usually look is this middle window pane here. So this gets, um, if you go from left to right, it gets more and more specific to the anatomy where you're located. So I clicked here, so that's, it's telling me in the right cerebrum, so the right side of the brain, it's telling me it's in the temporal lobe, it's in the middle temporal gyrus, it's in the white matter, and it's basically in the middle region of the white matter in the temporal lobe. So if I try to find, for example, so that's the parahippocampus, so if I click here, this is telling me down here now that it's the left hippocampus, and that's the most specific, it's telling me I'm in the parahippocampal gyrus, I'm in the limbic load and things like that. So if you click around it will again automatically be updated and tell you where you are in the brain so that's useful. For VBM a lot of the time you want to know about the clusters so there's a button here that says report. I'm gonna move this window over a little bit so you can see. So when you click report it will generate in the MATLAB command window a report of all the clusters. So when I open it it tells me that there are 28 clusters based on the stats that I have now. I'm going to talk about that later, but let's just go to this window. So it gives you information about each cluster that it's recognizing. So it tells you the number of voxels in each cluster, the coordinates of the cluster, and then it will give you the anatomy information that I was talking about for each cluster. So that's really nice. So it will tell you that these clusters are, let me find a bigger one for example. So this one's 136, and this is mostly in the superior motor area on the right, amongst other things. Now, now this is showing up a lot of little clusters and obviously the main cluster that we care about I guess would be the schizencephaly. So if you want to change it so not as many clusters show up, you can change the stats before you run VBM, but you can also change it in real time here, certain things. So this is recognizing 28 clusters, but what is it considering a cluster? So you can change the p-value to make it a little bit more stringent to consider it an abnormal voxel. So if we do that, I added another zero, so that removed some of the clusters now. The schizencephaly is still there, obviously. You can also say that a cluster has to be at least, let's say, 20 contiguous voxels. So if you click and change the cluster size here and make it more uh, stringent, then that will also get rid of some of the clusters. So now if you click report again, and we look here, now it's only picking up eight clusters, and the information has changed a little bit because some of the smaller, more insignificant clusters have been removed, so that's really useful as well. For this here, for false discovery rate, if you want to do that, you first have to pick whether you're looking in the positive clusters or negative clusters, because you'll get an error if you try to do both at the same time. So if I do negative, then you can put a false discovery rate, for example, 0.05, and that will update the p-value that you need and show you if any of the voxels still meet that p-value requirement. So as you can see, it changed it automatically. If I erase that, then I can go back to manually fix whatever p-value I wanted, and it will go back to the way it was. Now the T statistics it shows you and the degrees of freedom are here as well. Another thing that you sometimes will use will be that you're looking at it and you're wondering, well, it says that there were maybe eight clusters and you're, cons and you're wondering what is considered a cluster. So if you click for example, one part that you think is part of a cluster, such as here, you can click this window or this button here that says pick cluster, and it will show you that one cluster. So even if here it looks like it's separated, this whole thing is being considered one cluster when it's calculating the number of voxels and the statistics, for example. So if you click that here, it will also print out a report in this window and tell you, okay, this cluster has a lot of voxels, over 5,000, and then it'll give you all the same information from the report, but just for that one cluster. So if I go here, we have eight clusters, and we can find, you see, so, oh no, it's not this one. So it's considering 
I think I changed the statistics, but you can basically find which cluster is matching up to the statistics here. I think I was playing around with it, so that's why the numbers are a little bit different, but this, this cluster 4 is probably the cluster I'm picking here now. So you can match it up that way and see where the report is picking up the clusters on the map. And after you click this, if you want to undo it, what I do is usually I'll just click the radio buttons. And if you just click positive or negative and then click all, it will show you again the clusters because it, they don't really have an undo button. So you just have to kind of click around to undo it. And now it's showing the same number of all the clusters again. This button here, render, it'll just show you kind of a three-dimensional view of the T-map on a brain. I usually don't use that very much, but I guess it could be useful. For this, this clear selection button will just get rid of the information on this window. Another thing that's really useful is this slice view. So this will open a window that will show various slices, and you can view it in the coronal, sagittal, or transverse planes. So that's really useful. I use that sometimes if I'm trying to see if a cluster really is significant to see how many slices it will go through. So as you can see here, you can visualize the schizencephaly pretty nicely on the sagittal view, but maybe on the the transverse, you can't really appreciate it as much. So that's another useful button. Let me see what else did I want to talk about. I don't really use these buttons, but it lets you search through anatomy and a couple different programs. Another thing I wanted to talk about is if you have overlays. So for example, for this patient, we did a 3T scan and a 7T scan. So I did VBM for both of those um, studies, and then I want to compare are the clusters somewhat the same or which clusters are overlapping on the two studies. I went to open file. I'm going to click two T-map images and then click done and it's going to show me an overlay of the two. Now these are from different studies so it gave me a little warning um, window that went away that says these are from different sources but that's okay. And now that you overlaid it you can't see it very well. It's overlaying basically the two T-maps and the colors you can pick so if you want to change the colors. Actually on this computer it gives me a lot of options. On my work computer it only gave me like 10 colors to pick pick from, but you can pick two colors, um, like two primary colors to see like a secondary color for the overlap. Again, you can't really see it very well and it overlaps a lot because in this image the schizencephaly obviously shows up for both scans, but if you can kind of see it looks green a lot, which is the yellow and the blue overlapping. Here you can kind of see that this area is a little bit yellow, so it's just showing up on one of the files and it's a little bit blue here, so that's showing up on the other file. So so that's really nice as well. You know, if you can't pick exactly which regions are common to both overlays, well, you don't have to because there's a common region button here that's also really useful, and it will pick out where the two images are common. So again, it's showing you that the schizencephaly shows up on both scans, and the whole thing is pretty much, and it, also this area as well, which I guess, I don't know if that's part of the schizencephaly or not, but it's showing up pretty conclusively that this area is abnormal. Another thing that you can do, which you can get this through SPM, but it'll also show you from this XJ view window, is to get the statistics, which is really nice. So if you click volume, then you're going to need, if you do a VBM, it's going to be the SPM.mat file. So let me just find that. And it shows up as the only option in the folder and click done. And you can't really see it when it pops up. It doesn't let me make this any bigger, but you see the statistics for the set of all the clusters, the clusters here, and then the voxels here. Here, and it also gives you the locations of the clusters, which is really nice. So this gives you the p-values for, you know, whatever you want, the clusters or the voxels or the whole set. And let me print this table to MATLAB. So this is really nice if you want to see, well, I see a cluster, but is it actually statistically significant? And if so, how much? So you can do statistics on the VBM. All right, so that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about in this video. I think XJView is really helpful for VBM analysis so I use it a lot and it definitely can give you some more information than just the regular SPM GUI.